So they asked me if I would come to a lightning talk on academia, and I'm like, what does that mean? So instead, I decided to give a talk on why I love my job, okay? And this is gonna be unlike everything you've heard before, but hopefully it will give you an answer to the question that I know nags you, which is, in an era where I can go get a real job and make lots of money, why on earth would I go to graduate school and get paid peanut wages to like work really hard? That seems like a really dumb idea, so why on earth would I do that? And hopefully at the end of this talk, you can give that answer. So first of all, let me start out by saying that being a professor is kind of insane. So you do have to be just a little teeny bit crazy. Okay, this is my calendar for this coming week. The purple are places I need to be. The green are things that have to do with my course. What you will find absent in this is any time to actually prepare for that course, or the times that I like want to actually do research, like whatever that means. So it is kind of a crazy job. I won't lie about it, and yet I love it just the same. So why on earth do I love this job? Well, the first answer is because I have amazing students. So in an era where you can go into high tech and get these big salaries and do all this good stuff, the one thing that companies don't have and academia does are you people. And for most of us, particularly in engineering disciplines or computer science or any of these places where the job market is really quite spectacular, you are a huge draw for us. You're smart, you're fun, you're high energy, um, and you keep us young, <laughs> which is actually really important. So I love my job because of you guys, so thank you. Number two, why do I love my job? Because it's blank. No, I also get really amazing graduate students. And I'm actually gonna talk you through a subset of my graduate students, because A, I love to brag about my students, but B, because the job titles and the things these people are doing are actually not what you might expect. So when you go to graduate school, it turns out that that's really just a credential that opens the world to you for a huge range of opportunities. And so this is a, a very quick dance through some of the opportunities that my students have actually done. So this is in reverse chronological order. So here is Elaine Angelino, one of my more recent students. She's currently out at Berkeley. She's doing a postdoc. Her time is her own. She's getting a decent salary to do whatever she wants. It's not such a bad job, okay? Now, here is Jeff Schneidman, another one of my PhDs. He's a lawyer now. So after finishing a PhD, he went to law school, and so he does sort of intellectual property and patent kinds of law stuff. Um, there's no person to go with this, but one of my former students, um, when I knew him, he started out as Chris Stein. Before he graduated, he became Lex Stein, and he's now Tau Stein. Um, he works for Facebook. He teaches at a local university and he uses computers to create art and had an exhibit at the Venice Art Show this past year. Has anybody ever heard of the Venice Art Show? Okay, it's like a really big deal. And so he had a display, full-size wall display mounted at this art show. So who would have thought PhD in computer science, like artist, will come back to that? Um, here's Sasha Fedorova. She's sort of a more conventional person. She's now a professor at the University of British Columbia. Um, here's Griffin Weber. He's actually at the Harvard Medical School, so he's both a doctor as well as a researcher in computer science. So, like, he sees real life patients. He saves lives. How cool is that? He also does research. That's kind of neat. Um, here's Costas. We're now getting pretty far back in time. Costas is a professor in Greece. And then um, that's Keith Smith. He was one of my first PhD students, and he works for a company called NetApp. And then um, this is Ellie Baker, who is a, what I would call a mathematical artist. So she has used some of her technical skills to find really interesting problems in art. And so she's the author of this book. So it turns out that um, there's a technique called bead crochet, and you make these cool bracelets, and those bracelets are actually tori. And so if I pose the question to you, how do you get a pattern that you can place on a torus so it looks seamless? Turns out that's a really interesting sort of geometric problem. And so she and her daughter, actually, when her daughter was in high school, figured out how to solve that, and that sort of led into this foray into what I call mathematical art. 
And so she actually presents work, which are these aesthetically pleasing things at math conferences. How cool is that? Now, from my point of view, not only do my students go on to do amazing things, but part of graduate school is that you become an expert in an area. So by definition, if my students are becoming experts in areas, that means that they get to teach me things. So you all think of professors as people who teach you things. But in fact, one of the really cool things about being a professor is that I get to have these amazing graduate students. And at some point, it's complete role reversal, and they are teaching me. So I have one graduate student now who's taught me all about dynamical and chaotic systems. I have another graduate student who's teaching me more than I ever thought I knew about graph theory. And that's part of the joy, is that you're, I'm actually getting paid to keep learning. Another really cool thing. OK, what else do I love about my job? I have really cool colleagues. Let's see if this actually works. Oh, it did. Yeah, OK, maybe it'll work. Right? So here's my colleagues, right? and I love them, so I'm showing you all of them. There's a whole bunch of them. And they're really cool, and they're smart, and they're fun, and they're nice. And I get to play with them like all the time. So typically, we often play with other faculty by having shared students, or we teach courses together. I'm actually uh, co-teaching a course this semester with James Mickens, who I describe as not only brilliant, but the funniest computer scientist alive. If you've never seen any of his talks on YouTube, go check it out. Um, so I get these amazing people that I basically get to hang out with and play with on a daily basis. And that's really fun. All right. Oh, let's go back. Da, 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 da. OK, it even came back to the right place. OK, why else do I love my job? So it turns out that being a faculty member is really flexible. So one thing I discovered, I actually worked in industry before I went to grad school. So I've done the startup thing. I've done the high tech thing. And I learned something really important. I don't do well with a boss. Do you guys hear that? Okay, I really don't do well with a boss. So being a faculty member, you are actually sort of your own boss. You get to choose who to be accountable to. You can be accountable to your students. You're usually accountable to some of your colleagues that you're working with, or your grad students. But you don't have somebody who tells you what to do. And so that means that you have a lot of flexibility. So I am, <clears throat> if, if I got to pick whatever job I could do in the whole wide world, I would be a professional soccer player. Few things stand in the way of my being a professional soccer player. In other words, I'm not that good. But um, so that is one of my passions, though. So I spent all of last June traveling around Canada going to the Women's World Cup because that is a thing I do. And it was amazing. Was anybody in Vancouver last July? Excellent. It was awesome. So I watched the final. I flew home on Monday. And I got a new hip on Tuesday. And my surgeon says, I can be on the soccer field again this summer. So that's all good. So you know, what job can you actually easily take a month off? Not a lot. But I was in Canada. I could Skype with people. I had Skype meetings. I talked to my students. I did all sorts of stuff. And I also got to see every US soccer game. It was great. I also have a chance to be involved with my kids' schools. So I have two teenagers now. We'll talk about those offline. But you know, I'm on the advisory board at one of their schools. I'm really involved. I was involved when they were in middle school. I used to make cakes for the math team because it's kind of a geeky, cakey thing. Um, I go do Hour of Code at their schools. And um, in the 2011 World Cup, I also went to Germany. And yes, I got my picture with Abby Wambach. So any of you soccer fanatics, that's Abby, that's me. It was cool. Um, OK, so academia, you have a lot of flexibility. You do have to show up to teach your courses. It's a good thing. But your time is kind of your own. So that's another reason I love my job. My job also provides an opportunity to be um, intellectually variable. So you think of sort of research as, you know, you become an expert in one thing and you do that one thing. But I've done research in databases and operating systems. I've done research in graph structured data and storage systems. I've done research in face recognition. I've done research in automatic parallelization. And because, well, 2016, I do research now in machine learning, too. So even though I did a PhD in one area, I sort of have this credential that says, yeah, she sort of can do research. And so if you get interested in something, you can sort of go off and do it. 
fair enough said, most of these things I did after I got tenure. <laughs> it's true. Okay. Oh, there's the automatic parallelization. Okay, and then there's also a bunch of variability that happens just because, did I mention that I don't do well with a boss? So I get to be my own boss. And in fact, I did the startup thing. So um, all those banks that were listed here, once upon a time, they were all my customers. We, we sort of, there was a time in the sort of mid to late 90s that you could not use the internet without touching my software. That's kind of cool. Like, that's really cool. And then we sold the company to Oracle, and so I now hang out at Oracle one day a week. I spent a bunch of time on the board of the Usenix Association, which is a professional association. Um, I got to go to Davos one year, because, like, Harvard, whatever. Um, I've served on National Academy of Science panels. I'm currently serving on the CRA board. I did a short stint as an administrator and was a dean. So, one of the things I tell my students when they're seniors and they're getting really stressed out about jobs is to not think about what you want to do for the rest of your life. Think about what you're going to do for the next few years. Because the reality is that if you're 22, you can have an active career for as many of the next 50 or 60 years as you want. And you don't have to do one thing. You can change jobs. You can change careers. And one of the things that I like about being in academia is that I can actually sort of change careers and keep the same job. So I can try administration and I can still be a professor. I can do the startup and I can still be a professor. I can participate in not-for-profits and still be a professor. So for me, it gives me that safety of sort of not having to change jobs, but it also gives me that variability of being able to change jobs whenever the heck I want. And I encourage you, as you go forward in life, do stuff. Do stuff that makes you happy. Do stuff that challenges you and makes you keep learning and keeps you really passionate. If you start to feel that passion wane, that's a sign that it's time to do something else. Life is way too short to be bored. And I mean that about classes, too. Take <laughs> classes that challenge you. Do not take classes that are easy because you will be bored. And the worst thing you can do for your brains is let them be bored. So be passionate. If you need to change jobs or fields or classes or majors, do it. But you got a long life ahead of you and you better make the best of it. So the higher order bit is that from my point of view, what academia lets me do is it combines a love and a passion for technology with a love and a passion for people. And it brings them together in a really great way. I get to talk to folks like you. I get to advise the wonderful Wix folks and I get to come in two minutes under time.